Thank you very much, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure to chair this panel with such uh, um, excellent uh, uh, members of the panel. Uh, our session is entitled The Future of Economic Growth with and Without uh, Total Factor Productivity Growth. Well, it's almost an oxymoron because indeed, as we all know, um, real uh, future economic growth will be very much dependent on uh, TFP uh, growth. We all know that, uh, particularly in Europe, population is declining, particularly the working age population is going down uh, by 0.5% uh, a year, and uh, demographic projections indicate that this will go on until 2030. Uh, so, uh, without uh, TFP uh, growth, we will have uh, no uh, future economic growth to speak of uh, uh, in Europe at least, and the, the situation is similar uh, to a different degree in many other advanced uh, uh, economies. Um, so uh, we also know that TFP growth uh, depends basically on uh, innovation of uh, products and processes, of course, and that innovation is different from inventions. We have a lot of inventions going on. Innovation happens only when the ideas are brought to the market and find a solvable demand. That's when they really impact the economic uh, process. And in this respect, uh, already President Draghi mentioned um, what are some of the uh, divided opinions about this whole uh, subject, uh, which we can uh, perhaps describe in two layers. Uh, first, uh, the optimistics and the pessimistics about the possibility of a great jump of technological innovation. And uh, on the other side, we find uh, Bob Gordon and uh, Tyler Cohen and others uh, saying that uh, the low-hanging fruit of technological progress has been already collected. Um, they don't see the TFP has been declining for decades now consistently, so they don't believe that this can jump now uh, upwards in a significant way. Uh, and what is at stake here is not, again, the a dearth of inventions. There are many inventions. The doubt is about uh, the possibility of having uh, innovations with significant economic traction in the market and be paid for such that then uh, uh, GDP and growth will, uh, will jump. That's what they don't believe. Others believe, on the contrary, that the, all the uh, inventions, particularly the possibilities of digitalization, automation, robotization, will lead to huge technological uh, progress. Uh, and so increase in productivity. And, but then, then leads to the second layer of uh, uh, divided opinions between those who believe that if that happens, there will be no jobs uh, and there will be no income to demand the products that would be associated with the technological uh, uh, progress. So where will, would be uh, the jobs and how income would be distributed so that uh, there will be a demand for those jobs? Those are the pessimistics about that. And, but there are optimistics too, like David Otter and, uh, from Harvard and others that say, no, well, there will be an uh, enormous amount of new jobs. Uh, because that has been the historical pattern whenever there was a wave of innovation. Uh, the non mechanism is productivity goes up, prices go down, income for other products then increases, and then as human needs are insatiable, then uh, new products will be invented and there will be uh, jobs for everyone. So I'm not in, uh, taking any view on these two big uh, disputes because we are concerned here with a more narrow sort of uh, subject. First, with, uh, I think, a shorter horizon uh, of our reflections uh, today, not on these big issues that have more to do with, uh, I, I, I think, the long term, um, and also with the Europe uh, in particular. Uh, and there we know, and President Draghi already reminded us, 
that Europe lags uh, behind the US in particular. Lags because it spends less in R&D, around 2% against 3%. Uh, but also second, uh, in terms of composition, is the corporate sector that spends less than the US and explains most of the difference with the US. And third, that there is not enough uh, diffusion, that there are very good firms in Europe in the frontier, but then the diffusion doesn't happen in the same, uh, in the same way. And so uh, I'm happy that um, uh, we have a very good uh, panel to address these uh, questions. Uh, we have uh, um, first Professor Diego Comen, <coughs> Uh, from Dartmouth uh, College, uh, who has written a lot on precisely diffusion uh, of technology. So uh, we hope that uh, he will tell us something that is relevant uh, for us on that score. Then you, we have uh, Christophe Chazot, uh, who is uh, head of innovation in the HSBC uh, group. Uh, and we'll talk from the perspective of investors, what they look into to uh, uh, help and finance uh, um, innovation. And finally, uh, then we have uh, Professor Reinhild uh, uh, Voigelerus from uh, uh, KU Leuven University and also from Bruegel, who has written abundantly on the um, innovation in Europe. Uh, going into very granular analysis of uh, all the indicators and problems that uh, we face in, in Europe, in particular regarding the questions of organization of firms to uh, really promote and implement uh, innovation. So without uh, further ado, I will start by giving the floor to Professor Comin to uh, uh, start uh, our panel. The rules are, as you have read, that each panelist has 10 minutes uh, as an introductory remark, and then we will have some time for a discussion among the panel, and then finally we open to uh, the Q&A from uh, the audience. So, Professor Common, please. <coughs> Thank you very much, um, and thank you very much for the invitation to be um, in this um, very exciting conference. Um, the mandate, I think, is extremely broad, uh, and it's interesting to frame it so that we are precise about uh, what we talk about. So um, I find helpful um, to look at this plot, which shows the evolution of TFP, the level of TFP, in a number of countries, the US, the UK, Korea, Germany, Spain, and Ireland <coughs> over the last uh, 20, 20, 30 years. Um, and you know, if you look, for example, at, uh, at uh, Ireland or Korea, um, these are countries that have grown very, very fast over the last 30 years, um, much faster than, say, Spain, okay? Um, and you know, that presumably, especially before, uh, before 2000, that can be explained by differences in the rate at which they have adopted new technologies. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting question that requires certain tools and it will reach certain conclusions. That's not what I, I think we're, I'm going to talk about today. Um, I, I would like to focus on the other three lines uh, which uh, correspond to the US, the UK, and Germany, okay? And when you look at these three lines, um, the main observation is that they have evolved in <coughs> broadly similar ways. Uh, they, are, they are right in the middle, um, and they have grown at a certain rate, uh, quite similar, uh, until around 2000 or so, and then since 2000, they have evolved in a different way, okay? And so what I'm going to be focusing about is what has happened broadly since 2000 in this bunch of countries in the US, the UK, and Germany. And I think that will uh, help us frame better this issue of the slowdown in productivity, okay? So um, since 2000 or so, there's been a slowdown in productivity, uh, in productivity growth in, in, in these rich countries. Um, the question is why we have observed this slowdown in productivity, okay? Um, the US, for example, the slowdown is quite noticeable since 2005. 
Um, there are roth at, at a high level, there are two hypotheses to understand these, these dynamics for productivity. One is the so-called bad luck hypothesis that John Fernand has put nicely in a series of papers. And this, uh, this hypothesis uh, argues that there was, for reasons that have nothing to do with business cycle considerations, there was a reduction in the innovative capacity in the productivity of the US economy. And, and that, you know, kick in around the mid 2000s and is going to stay here for a while. Um, that's one hypothesis. An alternative hypothesis is what uh, I call the endogenous response view of, of, of technology. Um, and this hypothesis basically argues that um, by and large the slowdown in productivity um, in the US but also in this bunch of European countries corresponds to or re is the result of a response of business uh, activities to develop and especially adopt new technologies that have a slowdown as a consequence of the business and financial conditions uh, driven by the, by the Great Recession. Okay? And so what I'm going to do here is to lay down this alternative hypothesis and to show you some, first some evidence and then some analysis that speaks about its importance. Okay? Um, and this will be both in Europe and the US. Much of the analysis is done in the US, but there is lots of evidence that I'm going to be provided by in Europe. So what type of evidence I'm going to present? Well, I'm going to show you some evidence about innovation, R&D, and cyclicality. Um, but then I will focus on what I think is more important, which is the dynamics of the speed of diffusion of technologies. And in particular, I'm going to show you some new evidence on its cyclicality. And then I will talk a little bit about the Great Recession. I will show you some evidence of the, on some technologies in the UK okay? and, 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 and Germany. So this is the evolution of R&D, private R&D, uh, in the US um, after you linearly trend it. Okay? So this is the deviations from a linear trend. Um, and you, know, you see it's quite cyclical. It's slowed down in 91, slowed down around 2001. Um, and it slowed down a little bit during the Great Recession, but the slowdown during the Great Recession was not quite dramatic, OK? Um, now, let's show a little bit. I'm not going to show. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about, about this transition from innovation to diffusion, OK? And so to do that, I'm going to show you some evidence from Germany. This is a, a measure of the share of sales uh, by German companies on uh, new or improved products. These are new improved from their perspective, not necessarily from the perspective of the market, okay? So to this extent, it shows, uh, it captures uh, when a company develops a new, tech, a new product, but also when, when the company, it's not improving what we have in the market, but it's catching up with the frontier, okay? And so what you can see in this, in this plot is that the importance of, um, improvements in the, in the, in the quality of, of the products in Germany uh, deteriorated during the recession and doesn't seem to have recovered. Okay? Um, more formally, um, what I've done is I've, I've looked at uh, measures of diffusion of, of specific technological processes uh, um, in the US and the UK. And in particular, one, one beautiful example is Manuel Trachtenberg's data on the diffusion of CAT scanners. Um, and I've posed a model for the diffusion, statistical model that builds on the logistic process. And I've introduced the, a potential role for business cycles to accelerate or slow down the diffusion of technologies. And this is the first, the first, um, the first um, uh, row of, of this table. And basically what I've tested is whether the speed of diffusion of technologies is cyclical or not, okay? And so what you can see um, from those coefficients is that the speed of diffusion of technology is highly cyclical. Um, basically the elasticity of the speed of diffusion with respect to a uh, measure of the output gap is between three and four. That means that it moves a lot when the economy uh, enters into a recession or in an expansion, okay? Um, and so one illustration of that cyclicality uh, comes, for example, from the UK. So this is uh, the deviation of the speed of the diffusion of, of three technologies in the UK from their mean the diffusion. Um, these are technologies that, are, that measure uh, the ability of companies to uh, leverage on the internet to reach to uh, providers and, and, cost and customers. And so what you saw here is that 
In the UK, there was a slowdown, a dramatic slowdown in the speed of diffusion of these technologies during the Great Recession, and then there was somehow a recovery, but then in the long run, there's still uh, an impact, okay? So four years after the recession, we're still seeing a slower diffusion than what we uh, used to see. Okay, so based on this evidence, then what I, what I would like to do is to try to understand um, what happened with productivity growth uh, during the last 15 years, okay? And so basically to do that, um, you have to go beyond the um, macroeconomic framework that uh, President Draghi uh, described where there is a disconnection between business cycles and long-run trends, okay? And in particular, you have to enrich our macroeconomic models to allow for a technology to potentially be affected by the um, endogenous decisions of companies to develop and adopt technologies responding to business cycle conditions. And so that's what I, I've done you know, for the last 15 years to develop this class of uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. And so taking one of these models and disciplining it by the observations, the estimates using this micro evidence on the cyclicality of the speed of diffusion of technologies, as well as with the actual R&D spending series for the US, I can answer this question of how much of the productivity slowdown that we have observed in the US over the last 10, 15 years, it's due to cyclical response to business cycle conditions and how much is due to exogenous factors that have nothing to do with business and financial conditions. And so I'm going to do that in a, three, in a series of three plots, okay? So this first plot, I will ask you to focus on the black line and the, and the blue line. The black line is the evolution of the trended TFP in the US, okay? So you can see that around 2005, TFP started to decelerate, and this is linearly trended TFP, so relative to trend, it slowed down, uh, the slowdown continued during the Great Recession and then continued after the Great Recession, okay? Um, the magnitudes are very large, okay? They are not uh, quite as large, for those of you that remember the 70s and 80s, they are not quite as large as 70s and 80s. Macroeconomists don't know the 70s and 80s, okay? They, they, don't, know that they don't know the real productivity slowdown, okay? Um, but but they, are, they are significant. Um, now, in blue, what you see is the evolution of TFP as produced by the endogenous response of this model to a series of macroeconomic shocks that explain business cycle fluctuations, okay? So basically, if you think about how much TFP is due to the exogenous shocks that typically macroeconomists focus on, and how much is due to the endogenous response of a richer characterization of the technology side of the economy, um, the blue line would be the second one. And as you can see, um, basically, all virtually all of the slowdown in TFP between 2005 and 2015 can be attributed to this endogenous response in, 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 in technology, okay? Now, I would like to um, answer two related questions. One is what type of shocks produce this slowdown? And second, what type of mechanisms? So to answer the type of shocks, I will ask you to here to um, first look at the, the, the black line. This corresponds to the endogenous um, TFP evolution. Um, and, and then the other two lines, the, the blue and the, and the red line, correspond to the um, evolution of this endogenous TFP uh, driven by two shocks. One is a liquidity demand shock, which is what basically caused the Great Recession. So there was a, a disruption in financial conditions, uh, which was associated to um, people moving away from risky assets and <coughs> holding on to riskless assets. Um, and so this, this shock, um, uh, which basically is the shock responsible in a, in, a, in a historical decomposition from the dynamics of output growth in the Great Recession, it's also uh, fundamental to understand the evolution of TFP between 2008 and 2015, okay? So this is basically what, what drives TFP uh, uh, after 2008. The shock that is important to understand what happened between 2005 and 2008 it's a shock that it's a shock to the productivity of R&D technology. So basically, it's a shock that measures how productive are R&D investments in the economy. And so the shock in this setting can be estimated uh, by 
um, looking at the free entry condition for R&D investments of the agents, okay? So basically when we see a drop in R&D investments, um, that can be due to financial and, and business conditions or can be due to the fact that R&D is not that particularly productive at that, at that period. And so what we saw in the R&D data was that there was a big slowdown in R&D around 2001. And so that slowdown in R&D 2001 to a large extent was driven by a reduction in the productivity of R&D in that time. And because it takes time for technologies to, sh to, to, bring, to be brought into production, that only shows up in TFP three or four years later. Okay? And so this is what explains the pre-grade recession slowdown in productivity. Um, I don't have time to go through the details of the mechanisms, but basically, um, when you think about the role of R&D and diffusion, what was really important during the Great Recession uh, to understand TFP during and after the Great Recession is the slowdown in the speed of diffusion of technologies. R&D didn't decline that much, so basically it plays absolutely no role in explaining TFP after 2008. Um, so just to conclude, um, the decline in uh, productivity growth during and after the Great Recession, it's solely attributable in the US to the response of business to, um, to uh, the business cycle and financial conditions that induce them to spend less resources in bringing in new technologies. Okay? Um, this mechanism seems likely to be also quite relevant in, the, in Europe because at least in Germany and the UK, we have observed the same symptoms in terms of the slow and the diffusion of technologies as we have seen in the US. Um, the pre grade recession decline in TFP was due to a slowdown in the productivity of R&D, and I have some independent evidence that is consistent with that finding. Um, so that lends a little bit of support to the Gordon hypothesis, but it's something that um, didn't take place during the Great Recession. So during the Great Recession, uh, in a view that is consistent with uh, the, the um, discourse that um, we are finding from tech enthusiasts, uh, we don't see any slowdown in the productivity of R&D activities. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, and I, I'm sorry for insisting on the time, but uh, we have a limited time to, to manage. And uh, so I uh, would like now to uh, give the floor to uh, Mr. Christophe Chazot to give us, well, whatever he wants to tell us, but of course we hope that he will tell us uh, significant things about the perspective uh, from the investor side, big investor side. Please, you have the floor. Yeah, first, uh, thank you uh, to the Central Bank and to MIT to, um, to invite uh, HSBC and myself to this conference. I'm even more uh, uh, moved that uh, I'm an MIT alumni, so it's always a great pleasure to contribute to uh, the MIT research. Um, my role is head of innovation for the bank, and so most of my role consists in investing into startups that are strategic to HSBC in one of these uh, corporate venture capital that uh, Martin uh, has mentioned in his introduction. Uh, and we have a capacity of investment of 200 million that we invest into startups, about 50 million a year. And startups which are strategic to us as HSBC, um, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Um, and so before that role, I was uh, co-head of global equities and head of equity derivatives for HSBC and some other firms like Bank as Trust. And I thought that my job was exciting. But let me tell you, in the environment we know in finance and with innovation, this role is even more exciting. And why is it exciting is that all this innovation that we see in banking and in finance is mostly driven by entrepreneurs, mostly driven by individuals that create things and that bring it to companies like us, which are 50, 100, 1,000 times bigger than them. Uh, and these companies are called fintechs. So what is a fintech? A fintech is a technology company that operates in the financial space, uh, financial services. And you see that that's a broad definition, but there are two types of fintech. Those that try to compete with the incumbents, with banks, or those that try to help banks to develop. And these are two very different, uh, two different type of companies. One would be more B2C, and the other one would be B2B. And so, FinTech have really taken a, a predominant role in the innovation in the financial services industry. And it's interesting to reflect why. And it's a combination of both technological progress 
and the financial crisis arriving at the same time. And this same time is 2007. Actually, if you reflect and you come back to 98, 98, 99, 2001, you've got about the similar condition. Financial crisis in 97, followed by technological development in 98, 99 with the internet. This time, it's not the internet in 2007. It is the mobile, mobile phones, smartphones with the iPhone, and mobile data, 3G, 4Gs. But it's also a whole bunch of other innovations, like uh, capacity of storage, uh, which has been massively uh, increased um, with SSD drive. It is the cloud computing that was launched by AWS in 2006. It is a new algorithm in AI. So a bunch of new technologies that suddenly emerged in 2007. And then at the same time, banks were experiencing the worst crisis that they have known for like probably 60 years. Um, and so this crisis, which started in 2007, completely occupied banks and their whole time, their management, their resources. It, they had to remediate all the past mistakes with the regulator and so forth. And so that took away all their energy, all their resources, all their thinking away from the progress that we're seeing in technology. So it is no surprise that immediately you saw a bunch of entrepreneurs saying, hey, what are you guys doing? And let's do it. If you guys are not doing it, let's do it. And this is why we saw this exponential rise of fintech. Now, when you see startups emerging, it, their needs, it's not just startups, so it's not just entrepreneurs coming and saying, hey, I want to do this, and it works. They need other things. And in financial services, they need four things, and this is why they have been successful. The first thing is they need technology enabling them much more, and also prospect. And the good thing was that the technology gave new prospect to the way we were doing banking. So there was an exponential possibility didn't say that this exponential possibility was going to materialize quickly, but at least there was a possibility for exponential growth. That's number one. The second thing is money. And here, VCs, venture capitalists, start to put an enormous amount of money inside this business. In 2008, the investments of venture capitalists in fintechs were 1 billion. In 2012, it was 3 billion. In 2015, it was 20 billion. So they multiplied by 20 the amount invested in fintechs in about six years. So money is the second thing. The third thing is the clients. Suddenly the clients who were a bit upset with the banks that lost so much money during the crisis, which led to, to massive, uh, massive suffering in, uh, in a lot of countries, suddenly turned themselves to new, to new ways of doing banking. And they were quite receptive to these new ways of doing banking. And the fourth thing is the regulator. The regulator, probably upset with the way banks had handled this period, were also very keen to push new competitors and to encourage new fintechs to do business in uh, banking. So these four things are relatively important. And you see that in the 98 bubble, which also pushed some fintech, we have exactly the same conditions. So exciting times, but the question which uh, I want to ask now is, is that sustainable? Uh, can these companies continue to grow and they can continue to develop and to bring their expertise to the financial services? Are they, are they going to hit a wall like they did in 2001? Remember PayPal, for example, that needed to sell itself to eBay? Remember all these companies that disappeared at the time? Or have they, you know, can they continue to grow? And the second element which I'd like to tackle is, what is really innovation in banking? And are there tensions there? So if we look at, uh, at fintechs, there are, in fact, uh, two areas, and we need to differentiate between developed countries and emerging countries. And the situation is very different for companies in these two spaces. In developed countries, the banking uh, is quite a mature business. It has been existing for a while. But because it has been existing for a while, all the rails, all the infrastructure have been developed a long time ago and works extremely well. Billions of transactions are done per day, not one fails. You never complain that suddenly you don't see a payment arrive when you've sent it. So it's very robust infrastructure, and reinventing that is very complex. And that's what uh, the fintechs that started to work on B2C, so talking to clients that were the clients of banks, started to see is that in fact their space was not so much in innovation because they were not really innovating. There was not so much innovating. It was just incremental innovation. And as you all know, 
when you enter in a space and you just do incremental innovation, it's all about price and it's all about clients. How many clients can you gather? And that takes a lot of time in the financial services. So a lot of these fintech in developed markets suddenly realized that they needed to pivot to more B2B type of model. In emerging markets, it's a bit different, like China, India, Indonesia, Kenya. Here, the fintechs really brought a new expertise by redefining what were the banking rails. So for example, in Kenya, M-Pesa completely reinventing how you were doing payments. Suddenly, you could do your payments in remote places with your, with your telephone, just a regular mobile with Edge. You could do payments there, whereas before, people needed to source the money. And sourcing the money can be hard. Sometimes you can't access to cash. If you can't find access to cash, you cannot pay something else. You cannot buy. The economy is stuck. You remember, we had the same situation in the Renaissance when there were not enough gold. So this situation can be solved with technology. And that's what FinTech broke in this emerging market. So the same thing happened in China, where Alipay completely redeveloped uh, the economy by uh, encouraging and developing this capacity of doing payments through digital wallets. Alibaba, Alipay, Tencent, they now own 85% of the mobile payments market in their country. So that's massive. So you see that in emerging market, you need to reinvent what are the banking rails because the banking infrastructure is not robust enough or is sometimes too ancient or not able to sustain the growth that the government wants to see there. And here, they need to see the help of fintech on a B2C basis and it's revolutionary. So if I summarize this part, developed market, evolutionary, B2B, emerging market, revolutionary, B2C. The second question is about uh, innovation in banking, innovation in financial services. And here what is very interesting is the tension that exists between the two. At the beginning, people were, and the, 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 the central banks, the regulators, were very encouraging the development of fintechs. And, uh, and we saw, for example, some uh, central banks thinking about how they could use uh, cryptocurrency in order to, to issue some currency. So they were thinking about that. They were thinking plenty of things. But in fact, progressively, there is a tension between, especially because banking is so regulated and it's regulated to protect the customers, uh, there is a tension between innovating and regulating. Can you do both at the same time? This is a challenging job. It needs to be done. But on the other it's very challenging. And this is why at the same time, you see some regulators like the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, the, uh, the UK regulator or the, uh, or the HKMA in, uh, in Hong Kong trying to push and develop the fintech environment by promoting and by launching a lot of projects. At the same time, you've got some regulators that also say, like Mark Carney recently mentioned, hey, robo-advisor could be a threat to the financial system. Or you see that uh, the ETF that was tried to be uh, ETF on Bitcoin that they tried to launch in the US didn't have the... Uh, 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 the okay of the regulator. So there is a natural tension between the two. And this is why uh, experiments like the sandbox, which has been done uh, by the FCA in, uh, in UK, where fintechs can try, can conduct an experiment and then see what is the result, you know, to alleviate the tension between innovation and regulation, are so important. So it's an exciting area. Plenty of things are developing. And, you know, we think it, as a bank, we think it contributes a lot to the innovation in our sector. So we are very keen to promote the growth of fintech. We partner with them. We invest in them. We also partner with universities and we, with other firms. But fintech is a particularly exciting part of our, of our daily job. Thank you very much and thank you for keeping to the time. Um, you raised a very uh, interesting uh, topic, which is this relationship between innovation and regulation. Um, but there should be no uh, conflict there. There should be no conflict there. It all depends on the good innovation and good regulation. What one has to keep in mind is nevertheless the fact that the sort of externalities and market imperfections that justify the existence of regulation in the financial system, those reasons 
are neutral to the technology of distributing and providing the financial services. So by the fact that there are now new ways of uh, distributing financial services, there's, that does not eliminate the sort of uh, imperfections, the sort of externalities that justify regulation. So that principle one has to keep in mind. And then, of course, there are bad regulations, there are uh, bad innovations or dangerous potential innovations, and uh, the solution, of course, is to be reasonable about all that. Uh, but it's an important uh, topic, and perhaps it's an avoidable, a certain degree of tension there. But now, I am uh, uh, going to give the floor to Professor Reinhild, uh, uh, who uh, we hope will tell us what are the problems in the corporate sector in Europe and other aspects that are really creating obstacles to uh, more innovation and higher productivity growth. Okay, thanks. Uh, I can talk a lot about problems, the solutions, yes. that's a bit more difficult, <laughs> but I also try. Um, so I'd like to go back uh, to, to indeed the challenges for uh, getting innovation uh, as a source for growth in, in, in Europe. Very high expectations of this, uh, but actually Europe has consistently already also in the past failed to really exploit its full potential for innovation-based growth, um, despite a lot of innovation policy strategies and targets uh, that we had. And I think it's important that we also take stock of, of um, our, our, uh, the past to learn on how we can actually improve in, in, in the future. Um, I'm going to be very quick in terms of evidence because you, you know most of this uh, here, how good or bad Europe is doing in terms of uh, innovation. If you take a look at the latest Innovation Union scoreboard, the, the EU consistently scores behind the US, um, is, is only very slowly catching up, and China is a very quick uh, improving on this. Uh, and the problem with, with uh, Europe's innovation capacity, it's, it's really a systemic problem, so it works on very different components of, of uh, innovation. It's a public sector funding, it's private uh, sector, uh, and the linking between the two financial market uh, access, uh, so it's, it's really a systemic uh, problem. Uh, but a very important part of, of the systemic problem is the, the business R&D intensity, uh, which continues to be far below of, of other countries uh, here, and that's a very pivotal part of the innovation system, on which I would like to, to, um, uh, to focus uh, my talk on uh, here. This is not to say that public funding also is, is not an important part of the story uh, here, uh, and particularly also because we, we see that in, um, in the post-crisis trend, the public spending on R&D is, is definitely also in jeopardy, particularly in those countries which are innovation-lagging countries here, which are also under fiscal pre pressure, uh, so that we do see an increasing uh, divide within Europe in terms of uh, public spending, particularly in the countries that were already uh, weak uh, here. But I'd like to focus most on, on this corporate R&D and why is it that Europe is, is consistently lagging behind behind and only and is not able to, to sufficiently quickly catch up. Um, and that's basically due to the nature of the EU's industrial uh, structure, which is really the basic reason why we have this persistency in, in, in our uh, corporate R&D divide. Now, the OECD work has identified that the problem in Europe is much more a problem of diffusion of, of companies that are uh, behind the frontier and are failing to catch up with the whole uh, a diffusion story. Uh, they also claim that there is no problem for Europe for uh, companies that are at the frontier in their sector. But here I would actually want to, to, to caution and say that maybe on average European firms uh, in, in average sectors uh, at the frontier are not doing uh, that badly, but the problem still is that we are missing frontier firms in the sectors that really matter for innovation uh, growth here, and there Europe doesn't have the frontier firms uh, too uh, in these uh, innovation-based growth sectors here. And that's the overall problem of U Europe's innovation industrial stru stru structure, which is still too much focused on uh, the average medium tech sector uh, with, with strong older incumbent firms that are doing well, but where we are definitely missing the frontier companies in the sectors where there is the most uh, scope for innovation-based uh, growth here. So it's this deficit in a, what I would call a capacity for creative destruction is because we fail to specialize in particularly those new emerging sectors 
where there is the most scope for innovation-based growth. And basically, in those sectors of why Europe is not failing to specialize in these uh, sectors is because we're missing the pivotal companies uh, in these sectors uh, here, which is, uh, are these young, innovative companies that can really make it to world-leading status uh, here. So it's this overall failure to specialize in the, in the right type of sectors um, and with the companies that can make that specialization change uh, here that's overall uh, Europe's um, problem of why its corporate R&D fails to catch up sufficiently, uh, sufficiently fast. Let me just give you a few um, pieces of evidence on this. So when, when I talk about innovation-based growth sectors, I mean those sectors where R&D is a very important driver for growth uh, and where also uh, R&D um, changes also very quickly. So there is a lot of scope for, uh, for innovation to drive the growth process and where there are lots of young companies that are driving this. So that's particularly an ICT story. Um, with uh, both computer hardware and services, uh, um, but also particularly uh, the, the software uh, services part of it. Uh, this is also a biotech uh, story here, but it's not exclusively only those uh, sectors. Here is in general uh, new emerging markets uh, here. Um, if you talk about these young innovative companies, uh, the companies we have in mind are uh, not the startups, but the ones that have already grown to become world leading uh, innovators uh, in their sectors here. So these are the examples like Amazon, the Googles, the Microsoft, unfortunately, most of them are all uh, US uh, here. So just to illustrate uh, that our R&D landscape is really focused on way more classic sectors here. So on the left side, you have the more dynamic sectors. So these are the sectors where there's really high growth in R&D, uh, where R&D is really driving uh, the innovative potential in these sectors uh, here. You see that in none of these sectors, with exception of aerospace and defense, uh, and also pharmaceuticals, but pharmaceuticals is, is, a, is a bit of a broad sector here. In all of the other sectors, um, Europe is not specializing its R&D uh, force uh, into, and it holds particularly in software, like for instance, internet, we have no leading uh, R&D players uh, here. On the right Right side, you see where we do specialize in, and those are very classic sectors here, uh, where we specialize our R&D um, uh, expenditures in. So that's industrial machinery, industrial metals, electrical components, chemicals, automobiles, and parts here. So these are um, sectors which are more classic, uh, where R&D is important, but more as, a, as an incremental uh, uh, factor. So uh, here you see who these leading companies are in terms of uh, large uh, scoreboard uh, companies, companies that spend a lot of R&D um, in the world. Uh, you see on the top the US, you see on the bottom the EU uh, companies here, you see where they are in the world rank of biggest spenders here. Uh, what I'd just like to point out is that if you look at the ones that are the largest spenders in the, in the US, um, the ones that are young are the ones that are colored. Um, if you look at the EU, uh, you see there is almost no, all, all of the leading spenders are older established uh, companies and in sectors like automobiles and parts, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, so more the classic sectors here, while uh, in the US, the composition of the R&D landscape is way more in these younger uh, leading firms here, uh, and then also particularly in, in ICT and particularly software services. So what you see is that actually overall, and so this were just examples, but that holds in total. So what you see is that the EU's R&D landscape has fewer less or has way less of these young innovative companies that make it into world leading innovators as compared to the US. And it matters because these young companies are way more R&D intensive. Uh, so they are an important driver of R&D change. Um, and what we, what we do see also is that the reason why in Europe our young innovative companies are less R&D intensive is because if we have young companies, they are still in the more established older sectors here and way less in these uh, new um, uh, emerging markets where there is way more scope for, for uh, innovation growth uh, here. Um, because if we would have, and that's what you see in the last uh, row, if we would have these young innovative companies in the right sectors uh, and the ones we do have, Unfortunately, we, we don't have enough, but the ones we do have are as R&D uh, intensive and dynamic as their US counterparts here. So it's really a failure of, of the uh, R&D landscape in Europe 
to specialize on the sectors where there is most scope for innovation-based growth. Uh, if we would have more of our young companies in those sectors here, uh, we could really improve uh, on our corporate uh, R&D performance uh, here. So that's overall a bit of a, the story of the creative uh, destruction story here is we keep too much in, in the existing sectors here and not moving enough to the, uh, the new sectors uh, here. And that really matters for, for closing the R&D gap here. So we did a bit of decomposition analysis here. If you analyze the, the gap that the EU has relative to the US, uh, actually only a very small part of it is due to our older established companies. They do as well as their older established uh, counterparts in, in, in the US here. It's really because we have fewer of these young companies, but the most important uh, part is really that the young companies that we have are not sufficiently innovation active here because they are not in the right sectors uh, uh, emerging uh, here. Now, of course, the, the problem then is why are we missing these young innovative uh, uh, companies in these innovation-based growth sectors uh, here? And that, of course, is a, is a, is a problem that is uh, due to many different factors that play at the same time. So that's, on the one hand, simply because there are lower returns from investing in innovation capacity for these young innovative uh, companies. We did some econometric uh, estimates on, the, on this, comparing U.S. high-tech YOLI firms compared to uh, to the EU, and their rates of return are, are su substantially smaller in, in Europe uh, here. So that, of course, uh, gives them lower incentives to invest in, in the right um, uh, in in, in, in R&D here. Uh, but on top of these low returns from investing in innovation capacity, there are of course also higher barriers uh, to access uh, resources for innovation. Uh, there are, and again, it's a multitude of, of, of barriers here. Uh, often mentioned is the risk taking financial markets, um, is inflexible labor markets so that they don't get access to the right uh, skills uh, here. It's insufficient linking to the right signs that they would uh, often uh, need in these new emerging markets uh, here. Um, but also all of, the, all of these uh, higher barriers always have to do, again, with a lack of single market. Uh, here it's, uh, it's, it's not only the fact that it's difficult to link within your own uh, sub subset, uh, but also that it's very difficult to access uh, these resources, would they be available uh, within a European scale here. So for me, a very big important story of, of why Europe is missing these young innovators is, this, um, uh, is, is the, the lack of a single market, both product markets, but also a lack of single market in many of the input uh, factors uh, here. Uh, so the, the policy agenda, what to do, uh, but that's um, uh, a big agenda uh, here that's not easy to deal with. So what we should focus on more is really on, on, on focusing on that creative destruction uh, element uh, here. So it's not just enough to say we need more innovation, but it's really uh, also allowing the destruction to take place so that resources can be freed to go into really the new areas uh, where most scope for, uh, for uh, change uh, actually is. Uh, the current emphasis on framework conditions that is in, in, in EU policy level uh, present um, is of course not, not the wrong strategy here, but it's too much focused on the average uh, innovation uh, here. So it's improving access to finance, access to skills, uh, access to large markets, uh, having partnerships here, but it doesn't focus enough on really these new emerging markets and what the specific barriers would be for these uh, new leading firms in these new emerging uh, markets, uh, because that's always, it's not just access to finance, it's really early risk finance, it's not just access to science, but really access to frontier uh, science that matters, it's not just access to customers, but really to the risk taking lead first time customers uh, here and complementary suppliers and really specialized uh, know-how for these uh, young innovative uh, companies uh, here. So it's really a much more clearer focus on the new uh, emerging markets uh, here with their specific constraints uh, that I think uh, is more important and it requires evaluating and monitoring uh, how well we are doing in these uh, new emerging uh, and innovative markets here because it's, it's fair to say also that uh, it's hard to know which policy instruments would work in these settings or not uh, here. We don't have enough evidence on that yet so that's why I think close monitoring of what's going on, trying experimenting with also new policy instruments uh, here. Um, and then uh, evaluating whether these, these new experiments actually work or not is, is an important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, insights on policies. Now we, uh, I open a moment of uh, 
interaction uh, among the panelists. So I know that Professor Komin already wants to say something about your uh, intervention, so please. No, I, I thought it was very interesting. I, I think that I had two thoughts that came to mind immediately. The first is that I don't think it's the appropriate way to frame it, to compare the US with the whole Europe when, when it comes to innovation. Uh, because innovation, R&D, requires lots of knowledge. You need to be at the same level of development. And we know it's very nonlinear. You know, only the very, very, con you know, most developed countries do a significant amount of R&D. So if you bunch all the other countries in Europe that are way below that frontier, then, you know, you are basically blurring the image. And so when you, say, compare the U.S. with Germany, which I think are two countries that are in similar, similar leagues, then this is what you see. What you see is that they have grown, you know, TFP growth, their productivity growth over the last 20, 30 years has been very similar. Um, they spend the same amount of R&D uh, as a share of GDP. The private R&D as share of GDP is also the same. Um, they differ in the sectors. Um, so the U.S. does pharmaceutical, software, and, and electronics. And Germany does, uh, you know, machines, cars, and tools. And, you know, in the way you portray it, you assign a, a negative connotation to those sectors that the Germans do. But, for example, in terms of the economic complexity of their exports is greater in Germany than in the U.S. So, you know, I mean, this is a Ricardo Hasma's index, and it dominates. Those sectors that um, um, the, the Germany has focused in their R&D have a feature, which is that uh, they leverage more on the semi-skill uh, type of workers that they produce dramatically, and therefore, they are harder to outsource. And so, you know, in the vein of what the provost mentioned at the beginning, you know, um, no wonder why the Germans have kept their manufacturing in land while the U.S. has lost it. I mean, if you specialize in pharma, electronics, and software, um, it's very easy to, you know, very profitable to send the production elsewhere. And as a result, you know, uh, inequality has remained much lower in Germany than in the U.S. And I'm not going to go into the political implications that this has had in both countries. In the U.S. it's quite obvious. Um, so, so, you know, not uh, denying uh, the necessity to foster innovation, Different policies. I mean, I, I think German policies are particularly interesting. I mean, I, I, I think that micro uh, element of the talk comes tomorrow, so I think I, I would like to talk about that tomorrow. But 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 I think that uh, the the picture is is, is much more. Uh, the, the, it's a, it's an impressionistic drawing. It's not a you know a classical drawing. So the, there's lots of detail into the into the drawing, and so. My perception, you know, I, I mean, I think the se picking sectors is not, is not, uh, I mean, based on, on what looks cool, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit difficult because uh, German, the German sectors have been particularly productive in terms of delivering TFP, fostering exports, and keeping inequality relatively lower. Can I? Yeah, yeah, sure. No, it's <laughs> yeah. <fine. laughs> yeah. So comparing the US and the EU, um, I, I also agree we have to always go to a, to a deeper level here, but the US also is a very, is, is not a homogeneous market too. So there also you have a very big differences among states here and it's, it's very often, it, it will, the, the growth will be driven by, uh, by a few regions which are very well in particular sectors uh, here. So that also holds on, on the US side uh, here. You, you really have to go to a much more granular level to, to really uh, understand uh, the, the dynamics of, of innovation systems uh, here. The point was not that I want to make that there are bad sectors uh, where you should not specialize in. Um, it's just that if you want a dynamic R&D process that, that funnels growth uh, here, then you, uh, if you would only focus on those sectors where there is a limited scope for technological opportunities to drive growth here, that will be way more difficult to, to uh, increase the growth potential for innovation. And sectors that offer way more uh, technological opportunities for growth here uh, are important sectors that also should be sufficiently part of your portfolio of activities uh, here. Now, if you mentioned Germany um, and, and the car manufacturing, it's actually 
maybe a nice story here because, of course, Germans are very good uh, in increasing productivity in, 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 in their, uh, in their uh, sector here. So they have a high TFP. They, they're very good in incremental innovations here. But there are some really drastic changes going on in, in, in the automobile sector here, uh, moving to connected cars, where it's really the combination of digital uh, and, and cars here. And you see that, that Germany is, is actually really struggling to keep up. I'm not saying they will lose the game. I hope not. But it's, it's, it's not obvious. And there are important other players that are coming in into these sectors here, which are really creating way more scope for technological opportunity here. Um, and therefore, you do have to be really very careful about uh, what kind of, of companies you have in that sector here to really pick up the challenges that are uh, present in, in these sectors uh, here. Again, it goes back also to ICT content of the different uh, types of activities and sectors, because that's very important. What is now driving uh, uh, everything is digitalization, uh, invading uh, everything. So, but you want also to chip yeah, no. in on this one. No, no, I was, re I was reflecting on this R&D, and um, I'm part of a sector that, that invests little in R&D, actually. We were discussing with the chief scientist of UK uh, recently. But... Well, I was re uh, I was looking at, uh, at at a report on statistics, and uh, when when you ask companies uh, where is innovation coming from, actually the answers are quite uh, quite uh, amazing. Like 41% respond that employees create innovation, 40% reply that business partner create innovation, 40% uh, create say, that customer create innovation or bring innovation, and then just 17% say that it's R and D. Uh, actually, there are statistics which show that it's even lower. And so, is R&D really producing innovation? That's a question I have when I hear you talk. Uh, it's, uh, and, the, and, the, and the second question I had uh, relating to that is, we see more and more that companies like Google or Microsoft or other, in fact, innovate through acquiring other companies. So, are we moving to a different model? I mean, uh, like Google, they, they, high, they, they acquire like five, six companies per quarter. You know, they acquire DeepMind in order to sell some AI, they acquire Microsoft is the same. So are we moving on from, a, from, a, from a, something where big companies were doing R&D and this was generating innovation to something else? Yeah, so it's not that, that there is only one type of company that would actually be the innovating company. We really have to understand the heterogeneity in, in the ecosystem uh, here. So we have the, the, the incumbent firms, which will be uh, adopting technologies uh, here. And probably those are the ones that you were survey <laughs> surveying uh, in your case. Then you have the, the, the small startup companies that, that some of them will actually grow uh, to become world, new world leaders. Otherwise, others will be taken up either by incumbents or by some of these growing uh, companies too here. So it's really the whole ecosystem that you have to understand of different types of companies that play very complementary roles. Uh, and, and it depends on whether you are really pushing the frontier from the start with really frontier innovations that are really completely disruptive. That's a different kind of ecosystem that then will evolve once the technology becomes more mature as well. So you really need to trace these ecosystems and what the best composition of these ecosystems are over the life cycle of technologies here uh, and really looking at disruptive uh, um, uh, moments in time of, of the technology versus the, the more maturing ones uh, here. And what we need to, to understand better also from a policy agenda is how to support the right type of ecosystems uh, here. Where are there failures in terms of that the market doesn't reach enough that ecosystem between the different types of, of innovators uh, here. Can I raise a question for... Uh, yes. Yeah, so so fintech is also a very nice uh, example uh, here of um, uh, so the incumbent uh, um, financial sector companies here and then the startup companies and you mentioned these two types those that serve service as clients the the, the banks and those that go directly to to. Uh, um, to the clients. So, and you mentioned also the impact of regulation. Uh, so, I was wondering to what extent actually the, the regulation is is, uh, is indeed, like you say, is it, is it a barrier to innovation uh, or does it protect uh, consumers um, for the wrong type of innovation? So, in general, there is a lot of discussion also at EU level on, on, on having using the innovation principle in financial regulation as you design the regulation in such a way that it's completely neutral to 
any type of, 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 um, of technology that is being used here. So do you think that the whole process that we had of, of uh, financial regulation was sufficiently neutral in terms of allow, allowing these new fintech companies? I think that uh, you, you were you are going to ask questions. That's not the case. I'm we're going to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, seriously, we um, yeah, regulation is very important in our in our activities, much more than in any other activity, maybe apart from pharmaceutical. And it is essential because the role of bank and the role of financial system is to grow the economy but protect it from collapsing. So having uh, regulators that do the job that put regulation is essential and uh, paramount. So, you know, that's, that's it. Uh, and otherwise, this system would collapse. And we've seen uh, some, of the, some of the consequences happening from time to time of, of things which are not exactly properly regulated. Uh, but, uh, and regulation is also a fantastic innovation capacity for us. So, Whenever there is a regulation, there is often a lot of innovation behind. So, for example, take the swap market, which is a multi-trillion dollar market. This was created because of the uh, forex regulation that were existing during the 70s that prevented money from flowing between countries. And uh, the financial system invented uh, the over-the-counter and derivatives and, uh, and swap market. So you see that innovation uh, is very often generated by, uh, by regulation and by constraints. But there are also the difficulty, I think, of the, of the regulator. I was, I was not saying that regulation hinders innovation. We need to be regulated, and for very obvious reasons. I, I was just mentioning the challenge that it is for regulators to try to do the right regulation that at the same time protect the client and at the same time foster innovation. And I want to give uh, two examples. The first one is, uh, is the, the cap on interchange fees. Uh, you may know that uh, when a credit card, uh, when a transaction is happening on your credit card, in uh, some countries like US, <coughs> there is no cap on the interchange fee, which is on the money that the system between the bank, the issuing bank, uh, the acquiring bank, and Visa is taking on this. In the US, it can be 2 3%. In Europe, this is now capped to five, ten, uh, few basis points. And the question is, is that good or is that bad? Or not, is that good or is that bad? Because that would be a wrong question, but is it, what are the impact of such a regulation? And what is, it, what is very interesting is that the impact of such a regulation protects the customer because they pay less than in the US. But because in the US, with the 2%, they give you kickback in terms of advantages, reward scheme, and so forth, this doesn't happen in Europe. So it means that the incumbents, the Visa, MasterCard, and uh, there is no really other incumbents, the incumbents have, uh, who have a network that have been developed in the past year, with very, very low fees, nobody else can enter. <coughs> you will never have a new player coming in with, five, with fees of just five to 10 basis points. So you see, at the same time this regulation protects the customer, it also prevents the entry of new competitors because it's going to be very difficult for new competitors to compete at five basis points. Uh, PSD2 is another, ex is another interesting example where, again, you can, you say, at the same time you try uh, to open uh, the database of banks uh, and the capacity of banks to conduct payment to the outside world, which is an extremely good thing <coughs> and very good for innovation. At the same time, you wonder who is going to benefit from that. Because <coughs> fintechs are certainly going to try to enter in this market and process payment. But at the same time, you can also imagine that big firms like Google, Amazon, and so forth are going to also be tempted to act on this. Or maybe other banks who are going to try to look at what are in the accounts of clients of other banks and so forth. So, it is, what, what I was mentioning, is it is a very difficult job and it is extremely difficult <coughs> to, uh, to consider all the consequences in a world that is progressing so fast and where the opportunities arrive at such, a, at such an important speed. So maybe before, 20 years ago, it was easier because the developments were uh, much slower. Today, the capacity, the, the number of people that innovate, their capacity to innovate extremely quickly at scale using cloud, using data, and so forth is such that uh, the, the job is, is very challenging. And so there is a, a natural tension that exists. I agree with you. It's a matter of uh, proper 
uh, regulation, which, as you said, nevertheless, in the end, it will be unavoidable because of the nature of the activities we are talking about and, uh, and, and so on. So now I will turn to the um, audience for questions and uh, comments and, and so on. Before doing that, I just wanted to highlight one point that was uh, uh, raised by Professor Reinhild that I think deserves uh, being underlined which um, uh, has to do with the size of the market and the size and depth of financial markets. One of the things that we saw uh, is that what we have in Europe is old big firms doing uh, R&D and innovation and less startups. But startups in the US are benefiting from a very sizable, deep financial markets so that uh, risk capital firms can embark into financing very risky uh, projects and many of those fail, pure and simple, because in the ones that succeed, even if they are very few, by doing IPOs in a deep market, they can get high returns on the success stories, even if they are few. And that's why it's not uh, also totally proper to compare the US, say, with Germany or France or countries of that size. What we need, indeed, is more financial integration in Europe, and in particular, the uh, Capital Markets Union, if it could be achieved, uh, would be a big change and a big improvement in that respect, because it would uh, provide, indeed, higher returns for the uh, startups that really succeed by doing uh, IPOs into such deep markets. Uh, and we see, of course, in the US uh, good examples and perhaps not so good examples as the recent Snap uh, Chat uh, example uh, of a firm that does uh, allow these exchanges of uh, video texts and photos that disappear after a certain number of minutes and did an IPO and suddenly was more kept, uh, valued in the market than GM and other you know, good and, and uh, old traditional firms. But that's what a deep market, capital markets allow to happen uh, with, of course, big returns. Um, so now I open to the audience and I already had one uh, participant that wanted to uh, intervene and I will collect uh, other. One, two, three, oh God. Okay, so I, I, I guess I memorized the order. So please. Thank you. My name is uh, Stefan Neugebauer. I'm working for BMW. Mm -hmm. And I'm chairman of the European Technology Platform for Road Transport. And I have a comment uh, for you, um, Professor Reinhilde. Um, you described a very clear picture with the old economy, like automotive industry and the new economy like uh, data management, software and so on. But I think this doesn't de de uh, describe the reality. Uh, as you know, digitalization for road transport uh, will be a game changer and we are working on this very hard and there are a lot of opportunities in this area and even today uh, the value of a car uh, is mainly the electronic uh, the uh, electric mode um, and uh, the software behind this. So the different, um, the different pillars are coming together, the different sectors. So the future will not be described by thinking in silos, by thinking in, 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 in these areas. The technologies are coming together and this creates jobs and this creates growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I will um, collect three questions uh, and then we progress like that. Uh, please, uh, you are the first. Yeah, please, you have the microphone. Okay, yes. Uh, Manuel Trachtenberg from Israel. A uh, uh, question for everybody, but in particular yeah. for Diego. Um, you know, you presented very interesting uh, pictures of what's going on, and it's a great diagnosis or a few. It's like going to the doctor and asking for a second or a third opinion, you know, and you get confused. But the question is, what, what are the policy implications? 
of all that. And mm -hmm. it's not a coincidence that we are holding this conference here at the European Central Bank. And I must say that that very fact is an innovation. <laughs> Who would have said that, you know, that? But to Diego, uh, you know, the, the, you present a very interesting evidence about the fact that diffusion is, uh, seems to be responsive to the business cycle, okay, pro-cyclical. But you know what the president was saying is, hey guys, you know, I'm suffering from low productivity growth, so give me some productivity growth to get out of the cycle. So what's exogenous and what is endogenous, <laughs> it's in the eyes, eyes of the beholder. So, you know, because you seem to be saying, let's wait out, you know, this uh, cycle, and then diffusion will take off again. And, uh, and Diego and, Ma and Mario is saying, hey, give me some productivity growth to get out of it. Yes, there is some circularity in this because we estimate total factor productivity as a residual. So first comes the growth of GDP, and that may depend on other things, including the cycle, as you showed, and so on. But uh, of course, uh, Professor Common will answer you. Now I have down there. No, uh, below, yes, please. Uh, and then, uh, yes. And, and then you in the middle, So uh, I'm Jonas Svensson. I'm from the UN. I have a question to the entire panel. Uh, based on Deloitte's uh, study on the tax incentives for R&D and innovation, most countries in the EU have substantial uh, tax breaks. Uh, is that something that you feel have an impact, or have we just seen that it has very little impact? Mm -hmm. Well, now I, I will give then the floor to the members of the panel. Uh, so I think the first question was mostly for you, Professor Reinhild, please. Well, I'm very happy with the question. <laughs> um, because it's actually, it actually makes my point, is that these, uh, it's true, I don't want to, so you shouldn't interpret this as it's old versus new here. It's really, we, we should focus on emerging new innovative markets here. And these emerging innovative markets, they are indeed crossing any kind of, 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 of boundaries that we might have had in terms of skills, also on the science side, we see all these blurring boundaries between different scientific disciplines that have to go into these new emerging markets. And also the players, very often, new entrants are not necessarily completely startups. Those are entrants that were already in another sector and moved into uh, other applications uh, here. So it's really these new emerging markets, they, they do cross indeed and, and uh, cross a lot of uh, create and destruct also a lot of boundaries uh, here and particularly also like in the car manufacturing uh, all these connected cars self-driving cars here that's really emerging of of completely different disciplines and different sectors where also new players will be coming in and then the question is who will actually sit on top of these new value chains and will capture the value is it the is it the established old car manufacturers or is it the ones that come in with the digital technology so that still and that still depends on on what kind of specific, unique, uh, comparative advantages you bring into, into the value chain here, who will be in the driver's seat of these new emerging uh, markets here. But uh, I fully agree, you should not think of old sectors and new sectors uh, here. It's new emerging markets uh, here where you are crossing the boundaries of the old uh, sectoral divides. Uh, here. You, Professor Common, please. Yes. Um, you had a question. Too. So, um, I think Manuel's question is a very good one, and, and I think it uh, highlights uh, the point of disagreement between the class of models that I've developed together with my co-authors and the standard neo uh, traditional macro models that take productivity as given by God <laughs> and, and, you know, they use it as a, as a, you know, central bankers or policy makers use it as a, as a way to whip countries and, 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 and as if it was something that it was not impacted by certain economic policies. And so one implication of, of this class of models is that productivity is endogenous, therefore there's a class of policies that can impact it. And so if you ignore those impacts, you are going to I undertake their own policy. So just to give you a brief example, um, things that impact aggregate demand or discount rates are going to have a huge impact on the dynamics of productivity through adoption. And so if, say, Greece is having low productivity and um, you uh, try to uh, push them to cut their budget deficits, 
um, and, and to do a structural reform, thinking that that's the, the panacea for fixing problems, you may be pushing them to even lower productivity. And so ignoring that channel, uh, it's a mistake uh, that might be counterproductive. So that's, that's one thing. Um, on, on the question on R&D, I think, I think R&D is very interesting. You, you made a point before of you know, the source of innovation and why we do so much R&D. There is this all economist joke that the drunk man looks for the keys where there is light, not where he lost them. And so I think that R&D shares that feature, which is that we have lots of data on R&D and not on other things. And that's in part why we do lots of research on R&D, not only because it's important, but because we have data. And so maybe the, the, the keys are somewhere else. And so part of the problem, I think, is that, that is that. And, and then about the drivers of R&D, my sense is that money is not the most important thing. I mean, many people want to spend money on R&D, but they don't know how. And so I think that's one of the beauties of the German system, actually, that they have mechanisms to bring technologies to companies that they don't, per se, would have the ability to, de to develop them. And so uh, that, 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 that transfer of knowledge, I think, is critical to induce innovation. Um, I'm, I'm, not an ex I'm not an economist, so I don't uh, deal with data, but the anecdotal uh, evidence that I have on, uh, on fintechs, if you look at where fintech grew and, uh, and what was the mechanism, they grew, they started to grow from, uh, from the Silicon Valley. The Silicon Valley doesn't have so much expert in finance, but they have people, they have talent, people who are multidisciplinary. I think the, the capacity to source various talents at the same place from various fields is very important. And people that, that had the energy to say, hey, I want to transform finance because it's important for me and because it's important for the world. So talent and energy was the first thing. I think that's exactly what MIT has in Boston. The second place where fintech emerged really was uh, London. And here it's a different story. It's not so much about money, it's less about talent, although there is a lot of talent, but it's about the ecosystem. There are so many financiers, there is such an expertise and ecosystem around London with also people in data, with also people in, uh, in IT and so forth, that suddenly the, uh, the, the innovation emerged there because there are so many problems to solve and there was so much expertise in finance locally. So on the tax, I mean, I'm a banker, so. I'm always careful with deals that are just tax motivated because they tank at you in the wrong direction. Even though you do a deal where you get 50% uh, tax, you still have the deal, you still have the position. And if it goes wrong, you'll still end up losing everything. So it's better to deal on a deal which has no tax advantage but which is a good deal than just looking at the tax advantage. And so I think that these, these tax advantages are very good but sometimes it can also lead us in the wrong direction. And uh, I think the other elements are more important than this tax advantage. On, on the tax issue, uh, yes, please, yes, because that was the question. Yep. Yeah. So on, on the tax, R&D tax credits, there have been quite a lot of uh, economic studies on that, trying to evaluate how effective these uh, tax credits are. So first of all, at the level of the individual countries, there is, of course, always the prisoner's dilemma problem. If other countries are doing it, uh, do you need to follow or not? But irrespective of that issue here, so how effective are tax breaks? So in general, um, they are not too ineffective, <laughs> but the fact that they are very general and work for every um, company uh, here um, uh, doesn't allow enough differentiation into where the biggest market failures are, which are the companies where you particularly want to incentivate them to, to start doing R&D. And the tax credit is for that a too general uh, instrument here. And for instance, where it fails to work most effectively is uh, companies that were not doing uh, any R&D, how to incentivate them to start doing for the first time R&D. There it's not very effective for you. It's particularly effective to, to uh, improve the incumbent firms which are already doing R&D. But where there isn't particularly a market failure on the new firms trying to incentivate them, there it works less effectively uh, here. So tax, um, tax credits is one part of the instrument uh, here, but definitely needs to also be complemented with other policy instruments that would leverage where there are specific uh, market failures for particular types of companies. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, I have two other uh, gentlemen down there. Yeah, uh, at, at the back, yes, in the middle, yeah, you and then you, yeah, sorry. 
Yes, please. Thank you. <coughs> Jan Minier, European Patent Office. Uh, so I, I noted two, two key points uh, uh, regarding the, the need to develop innovation in Europe. So the, the lack of an ecosystem and, uh, and the lack of scale, meaning integration of the, of the single market. So I have a good news uh, regarding integration. Uh, the, the patent system is very fragmented today uh, in Europe. You have no single title for Europe, but this will change by, by the end of the year with the creation of the unitary patent and the unified patent court. And my question is, uh, how does this, how can that translate into a better ecosystem, and especially into the integ integration of the innovation ecosystem in Europe, and especially uh, with respect to funding? Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, you can uh, give the uh, microphone to, uh, yeah, that's right. My name is Please. Stefan Weisblock from the MIT Club of Germany. I have a, well, maybe methodologi methodological question, which mm -hmm. is, I think an experience that all of us here in this room can relate to, cultures are different. And uh, if you look at a, at a sort of microeconomic level, of course there are cultural differences between companies. There's also cultural difference between industries. And there's cultural, there are cultural differences on the national level. How does culture figure as a barrier or enabler in terms of uh, innovation? That's my question. Does it show up? Is this the, key, yeah. uh, the, the case of the yeah. lost keys in the dark? Yeah. Or is it, can it be ruled out because of your findings? That's yeah. my question. Thank you. Yes, uh, please, uh, here. Sir, can you uh, give the microphone here? Uh, I know you have also asked there, but OK, one here. Oh, is there a? Um... Yes, you, you, we can hear you. <laughs> about that at the end. And in view of Diego's comment, I'm really wondering, are the solutions at the European level? You know, you talked about the deep financial markets, or should we really talk about national, or in some cases even regional solutions to the type of issues that you've identified? Yeah, there are many drivers, of course, of the whole thing. Uh, some may be more European and others more uh, national. Uh, so we have three questions. Uh, so uh, who wants to... Uh, Try to answer the first question about uh, the importance or significance or potential impact of a patent office that will be uh, unified at the European level. Certainly, it has importance. Uh, how important? I don't know, really. I don't know if any, uh, any member of the panel will risk to say something. Yes, Professor Reinhold, please. Yep. So first of all, I hope that the Brexit discussion will not uh, jeopardize any of this <laughs> here. Um, so let's assume not. Uh, the, the unitary patent is definitely a way forward here, uh, particularly because uh, IP and being able to protect uh, your IP is very important for young innovative companies uh, whose, whose very often whose critical asset is technology, the know-how rather than the complementary assets to develop. So if they want to be a strong partner in the ecosystem with other uh, companies that supply the complementary assets that they need. They need a very strong uh, or a strong IP protection, which partly depends on patents, but also on other things. But patents definitely is, is an important story. Uh, it also helps these young companies to access uh, finance if they can uh, have uh, patents as a, as a collateral here. So reducing that cost and making sure that the patent protection works on a, on a larger market uh, here definitely uh, is, is, is a very good way forward uh, here. So I hope the Brexit discussion won't jeopardize this. <laughs> Anyone uh, will pick up the question about the importance of culture, uh, meaning, uh, you know, in a broad sense of uh, collective mentalities um, in different countries. Um, it's a very broad, uh, difficult uh, issue, uh, I'm sure, but, uh, and uh, certainly impacts things uh, in general, but we also see that uh, when we compare advanced countries, they have uh, sufficiently convergent levels of technology, of productivity, and so on, so it seems that in that respect, different cultures of advanced countries uh, are all compatible with the absorption of technological innovation and technological progress. Uh, so uh, maybe if we then look to other parts of the world and totally different cultures based on different uh, values, maybe we find, but then we have Japan 
And now we have China, and we see that, uh, you know, uh, in a broad sense, culture seems not to be the ultimate obstacle to, uh, to uh, technological progress. So uh, it's a difficult one. Now, on uh, the last uh, question on the importance of national, regional, and local, and European levels, um, what can you, any uh, of the members, say? And Professor Reinhild, you were uh, specifically uh, addressed to uh, on this one. I think the, the answer is like you expect, it should be complementary, right? So it's uh, um, what I think is very important, and actually it's a bit the same question also in the US uh, here. So you also have their regional uh, state levels and even below uh, state level, uh, but how that also interplays with the federal uh, level is, is very important, and I think that's a bit the same here in Europe. So we need a better connected set of policy uh, levels here where uh, you get way more leverage out of any regional initiative if it also fits within an integrated uh, market where the regions can also find uh, the, the, the right access to markets and skills and whatever and can also interconnect with other uh, regions at the EU level here. So, um, of course, the regional level is important, the local level uh, here, but if it's coordinated within, uh, within also a federal European uh, uh, policy level, you get way more leverage out of, of your regional uh, initiatives here. I think, I oh, yes, please. Uh, so on that point, I think one issue is that in general, we know relatively little about R&D policies and beyond, you know, the brainless R&D subsidies. Um, and so m much of what we have in different countries has emerged in a very organic way without clear plan. So, for example, just to give you an example of what they have here in Germany. In Germany, there's this organization called Fraunhofer, which emerged organically, you know, after World War II, to basically reindustrialize the country to do applied R&D and to bring technologies to companies. It emerged from that idea, but in a very, you know, unplanned way. Indeed, it was very inefficient for several decades, until the mid-70s when it became very efficient. And so that's just something that came out uh, in a country. Um, because we don't know very well how effective these organizations are, Fraunhofer in particular is quite efficient, but, but that's just beginning to be established now. It's hard to impose something like that at a European level. And so I think that the level of, 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 of at which you design the policies has to do a little bit with the, you know, with the evidence we have on the, on the policies, and so on. Thank you very much, and uh, we have exhausted our time for this session. I'm sorry for the members of the audience that still wanted to put questions. Um, before we um, get out uh, and go to a coffee break, before we will have our uh, set of questions via the mobile phones. And before that, I suggest we show our appreciation for the members of the panel. Thank you.